JP Morgan is warning that the S&P 500 could crash by 46%. Are they right? Or do they have their assumptions wrong? We're going to find out all that and more on today's show. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today because I think JP Morgan is wrong. No, I don't think that the market's going to melt up by 46%. I think the math behind their assumptions is off. But let you be the judge. Let's go through this and see if we can figure out why they're making such a bold call that the S&P 500 can drop so much and what perhaps might actually happen. Let's pick this story up. Here we go. J.P. Morgan warns S&P fair value at 2,500 if inflation shocks don't not fade away. So they're saying if inflation doesn't stop, stocks are going down. That's quite the opposite view that most investors have about inflation and equity prices. Last week, when discussing the latest Bank of America fund manager survey, we, this being Zero Hedge, pointed out yet another paradox had emerged. On one hand, Wall Street professionals were the most overweight stocks since 2013, while on the other, virtually nobody was expecting a stronger global economy in the future. Those two don't make any sense. And as Zero Hedge points out, an unprecedented divergence between these two data sets the likes of which has never once been seen in survey history. And here you can see a massive divergence and the fund manager survey of economic expectations has stabilized slash improved against the net percent say so global economy will improve. And here we see net percent expecting a stronger economy down. And what are they? All overweight stocks they are all in the inflation bet. The stocks will go higher, but that's not what the real story is in this question is, does J.P. Morgan have their assumptions right? And I'll tell you what, I, I don't think they do. But you be the judge. Let's continue on. So here we can see, whoops, there we go, that trying to answer this question, J.P. Morgan, Quant, and Nick, who in his latest flows and liquidity note titled, What If the Rise in Inflation Volatility Persist? Note, looks at what would happen to stocks if inflation and volatility surges. The reason why is because the strategist explains his longer term fair value framework for 10 year real yields. When you hear real, you think inflation adjusted yields, which we'll get into, and the S&P 500. Quote, inflation volatility is an important input as a proxy for term premium in the former and for risk premium in the latter. Now, what does all that mean? Let's finish this note up and then we'll dig into the details to see if we can decipher what he's talking about and if there's any validity to their claim. All right, here we go. And with upside inflation shocks in the US and UK last week, JP Morgan notes that the question of persistence of inflation has again featured heavily in our discussion with clients, while the steep rise in inflation readings have also raised questions over inflation volatility. Probably not a question that most clients ask about, but nevertheless, that's what they're seeing. Let's keep going on here. In other words, what does a rise in inflation vol imply for real rates or inflation adjusted rates in equity? And that is the question. Now we're gonna to try to do our own research here and see what we think is right. Turning first to the former, the JPM model values a 10 year real yield as a function of the real federal funds rate, inflation volatility as a proxy for term premium, and three major components of net demand for dollar capital from government, corporate, and emerging market issuers. The bank measures these as government as a government deficit, the corporate financing gap, and the EM current out account balance, all as percent of US GDP. Well, let's just make this a whole heck of a lot easier. Let's, at, let's look at 10-year real yield. I'm gonna show you how you can do this too from home. It's real simple. Just go to the Fred database and pull up the market yield on U.S. Treasury securities at 10-year constant maturity, add to that data set the consumer price index for all urban consumers and change it to a year-over-year -year basis, and then do an A minus B, and here you have 10-year real yields are low, and you can see historically we haven't seen real yields this low since 1980 and 1975, back when inflation was high. So what all this chart is telling you is that consumer prices are much higher than interest rates. And what is the broad belief that should happen is that interest rates should go up. That's what everybody thinks. They think that inflation drives rates higher. Of course, that isn't always true as we've discussed on this show. Now the question is, how does it impact equity prices? And that's a great question. Now, 
While JP Morgan is using the S&P 500, the Fred database doesn't have a long history on the S&P. So we're gonna to switch to the Wilshire 5000, which is just 5,000 US stocks instead of 500. Still gives us the same concept as what we're trying to look for. And what do we see? That when real yields go up, that is the question. And we're zooming in now to post 2000. What do we see? Equity prices tend to fall. Here you see real yields rising in the great financial crisis. And that tends to, you know, you're looking for sharper increases. You see a sharp increase here in 2015. That, you know, kind of puts a dent on the market. And due to my poor ability to do some screen capturing, real yields are rising. Equity prices are falling. Real yields take a big move up. Equity prices fall. And now you're down here. And the question you should ask yourself is what is the most probable direction for real yield? And that, my friends, is more likely to go up. But let's take a look at the same chart on a year over year basis and see if there's anything else we can determine. Uh, and what do we see? That when real yields go up again, this, uh, this is on a uh, percent change. Uh, this is just real yields rising versus the Wilshire 5000 on a percent change from a year ago. So it's a little easier to see that real yields rise, uh, market goes down, real yields rise, market goes down, yields rise, market goes down and rise and you see them going down here and so again next direction for real yield is most likely to the upside but let's dig a little bit deeper into jp morgan's research because so far we can validate that yes their call for lower stock prices does make a lot of sense but is it based on any sort of reality Let's go in here. In theory, higher deficits by governments and corporates ought to exert upward pressure on yields as overall demand for capital rises, while external surpluses of VN countries ought to push U.S. yields lower due to repayment payment of dollar-denominated debts or dollar asset accumulation by their central banks. Well, let's take a look at the first one, and they're saying that higher deficits by the government and corporates, we can look at the government should exert upward pressure on yields. Well, that's not true. In fact, here is a federal def debt, total public debt inverted. There's a little minus sign there against 10 year treasury yields. And what do you see as debt rises again, shown inverted interest rates go down, not up. So JP Morgan got you there. I think you're wrong on that. How about trade balance? Now, again, we can't go back and look at external surpluses of EM countries directly, but we could can look at the trade deficit. That data on the preliminary basis came out on Wednesday. Uh, here you see the trade balance goods and services, balance of payments left going down, and you see market yield on tenure treasury yields in red. And so what do we tend to see is when there are sharp moves higher in the trade balance, as we saw during the great financial crisis here, and you can see going into the dot-com bubble here. And what does that tend to do for interest rates? Oh, it tends to drive them lower, not higher. So I think JP Morgan's got a little, needs to do a little bit more digging in his research there. Here you can see the preliminary, preliminary data for the trade deficit going up from minus 97 billion, a record, all-time record low, to 83 billion. And what does that tell you now, again, it's one month, so it doesn't tell us a ton in terms of trend, but what does it overall tell you is the global economy is starting to shrink and slow. If you listen to Wednesday's video where we talked about treasury auctions, what did we say? It's a sign of a dollar shortage or slowing global economy. There's your evidence. You're seeing it happen right now. All right, let's pick back up this JP Morgan story. And it turns out their calculations increase in inflation volatility that has already taken place would push up 10-year real rates by 75 basis points or 0.75%. And if inflation vol, which we're not worried about, would, anyways, what they're saying, it would put a fair value on 10-year inflation-adjusted yields up 0.4%. So let's keep going here. And Ben, we'll come back to that chart from before. And what they're su suggesting is real yields should rise. But I want to point out that their view on this is that interest rates should rise. They're not talking about inflation going down. They're talking about inflation staying up and, and interest rates going up with it. Of course, we know if you've been a longtime fan of this show, it's generally not how it works. But anyways, let's take a look and see what actually happens and when real yields go up again because you can tell what half of the formula is what happens why are they rising 
Here you can go back all the way to 1975 because consumer price index heads lower on a year-over-year -year basis. Here you can see it, 1980 heads lower. Here you can see real yields rising because consumer price is going down. Here you can see in the dot-com bubble, real yields up because of CPI going down, great financial crisis, same story. And here we go again. So the question is, and will challenge, of course, JP Morgan on this, they think interest rates go up. We're probably realistically seeing an inflation CPI. We get disinflation. Maybe we get outright deflation, but the more probable outcome is lower CPI. Lower consumer prices or slowing growth of consumer prices is what actually drives real yields up not the opposite. All right, let's continue back to their story. Meanwhile, the broad, broader bond market has a similar to the BFA fund manager survey response looked as though the rise in inflation volatility thus far quote treating is a transitory shock. Although they warn if inflation volatility remains elevated, say fluctuating around one and a half to 2% for a prolonged period, this could start to put more meaningful upper pressure on term premium. Now, if you don't understand any of that, don't worry, because this is the next sentence we care about. This could further be compounded by the Fed's taper, given that one of the channels that QE operates through is via suppressing term premium. Now that, my friend, is something we can look at. So let's take a look at the Fed's balance sheet or the monetary base, and we'll overlay 10-year treasury yields. And they're saying, that, look, hey, the Fed's gonna taper. That's bullish for yields. Well, here's QE1. Now they didn't taper out that. Here's QE2, no taper. QE, uh, or here's QE1, QE2, QE3. And finally, we get some balance sheet taper it wasn't until later that we get the taper, but you see the balance sheet did draw down a little bit. Oh, hey, look what happened. Yields went down. And here you see it again, balance sheet taper. There's a little bit of upward pressure on yields, maybe kind of like we're seeing right now, followed by a whole lot downward movement in yield. So, so far, again, we'll say JP Morgan, we got you because balance sheet taper, well, that indeed is bullish for bond prices and bearish for treasury yields. But what does that do for consumer prices? Is that going to cause the CPI to stay sticky? Well, if you watch the Dr. Lacey Hunt video from a few weeks back, and we've been continuing to cover that this week on the money supply, then you'll know what's probably going to show you here is that's it's going to cause consumer prices to slow their rate of growth. And sure enough, we see the monetary base against the consumer price index on a year over year base rate of change. And as the Fed slows its balance sheet, you can see there was actual big drop in the consumer price index on a year-over-year -year basis. And here you can see the two of them go down together. Now, what does that perhaps mean for real yields? Well, not a whole lot, actually. When I overlaid real yields against the monetary base, it didn't actually give us any, any sort of useful information. It pretty much just tells us what we already know is that interest rates are going down and inflation is going down and that doesn't really change much for this picture, but we don't have a lot of data to go back to. We only have 2008. But what we do know is if the rates are fairly low, if they go lower, now you start to threaten the zero bound. And if inflation comes screaming down like the great financial crisis, real yields can indeed go a lot higher. So what does that mean for the fair value of all of this? Well, according to JP Morgan, in blue, the S&P actual, S&P 500 fair value, They've got it pegged. That's right, 2,500. That's a minus 46%. And not to out, be outdone is B of A, who has a bearish call on markets ahead of 2022's rates shock. And here you can see, for those who have been following B of A CIO, Michael Hartnett, sometimes disjointed thoughts and observations, chief investment officer, who he is, dutifully dawed down his weekly flow show report. It'll come as no surprise that B of A strategist has been turning decisively bearish in recent months you can see he talks about markets about to hit with three shocks how trade the bursting of the biggest ever asset bubble and of course the rate shock and the fed's policy mistake has already happened and so with that we can still say that jp morgan could be right on their call the s p to 2500 we don't know for sure but their assumptions of how it gets there i think they've got it backwards and of course you be the judge anyways thanks for being fans thanks for watching I'm Steve Van Meter. We'll see you soon. Bye now. The content of this video is provides educational information only. is not intended by investment or other advice. So it's not to be construed as recognition or solicitation by our science securities franchise instrument or to participate in any particular trading strategy. This video was prepared by Steve Van Meter on personal capacity. Been expressed this video that I do not reflect the view of Atlas Finance Advising or Steve Van Meter Financial.